mostly discuss about the good, but um, unfortunately, I have to tell you about the bad and the ugly around um, engineering uh, ex vivo T cells and adopt clinical uh, adoptive immunotherapy in general. So uh, many people have helped me through, throughout the years um, uh, to set up this program. Uh, funders, fantastic people, many of, uh, of whom are, are still very active uh, collaborators, um, and uh, a special thanks uh, to them. So um, the research program, very briefly, that I'm uh, uh, trying to, to keep afloat um, involves a, a lot of work from the basic sciences to the clinical sciences. So um, I study the mechanisms of T cell physiology, mostly T cell dysfunction, uh, and the translation of um, what I call a biologically guided uh, intervention to improve uh, T cell manufacturing processes. Um, I'm involved in cell um, cell engineering, and at the other end of the spectrum, I have I have led, as Terry said, uh, clinical grade T cell manufacturing uh, protocols. I've I've um, uh, acted as PI on uh, some clinical studies. Um, I, I'm also involved with a stem cell expansion program uh, we have at our place where I do the um, immunomonitoring. Uh, and um, this is uh, important because um, T cell adoptive immunotherapy is really a process. Uh, you start with a donor or a patient which are um, human beings with their um, uh, diversity, their um, illnesses, their, um, their uh, past uh, infectious history, their past neoplastic history. So um, it is very, very um, difficult to, um, to, to factor in all these aspects. Um, and you have to, to some extent, when you pr uh, prepare for these, um, these therapies. So adoptive immunotherapy started with bone marrow transplant, where um, a healthy donor would donate um, his or her stem cells uh, with accompanying, accompanying uh, uh, immune cells into a patient. Um, you can uh, play a lot with the donor cells, turn them into all sorts of things, including pathogen-specific T cells. You can uh, turn them into cars. Uh, and now, increasingly, people are trying to develop so-called third-party allogenic T cells, where a completely unrelated uh, donor um, has cells uh, prepared for a patient to receive. Um, so, um, in uh, in, in a way, some people are trying to turn the cells into a, a drug, so a, a generic, um, a, a generic uh, a product, which obviously has a lot of diversity from lot to lot for all the reasons I have mentioned. Adoptive immunotherapy can also be autologous, um, and um, this too has, um, has traction, uh, but usually this requires a, a lot of logistics. But it is possible, we have now in the province uh, and elsewhere, um, publicly supported uh, CAR T cell uh, program uh, that are reimbursed uh, by, by, by the state. So this is uh, standard of care now, um, even if it appears uh, fairly complex. So we have to consider adoptive immunotherapy as a continuum between um, uh, or around the manufacturing process. So there are pre-manufacturing um, variables. Um, the quality of the cells you manipulate is important. Um, to take, uh, to, if, if you allow me some non-academic language for a second, I would say that sometimes, you know, uh, garbage in can only equal garbage out. If you have battered cells, cells that are um, uh, th that have been um, uh, stimulated too much, that show already signs of dysfunction, it can be very hard to manufacture T cell therapies. Per manufacturing, all sorts of things can happen to cells, but it's also an opportunity to turn them into what you want. So um, you can reprogram them, you can come for uh, speci specific uh, 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 um, uh, properties, and it is in fact an opportunity. To, um, to change the fate of these cells and uh, create uh, therapeutic products. And the post-manufacturing is also important. Um, you obviously need to monitor this, these patients, but increasingly people are thinking about medical or pharmacological interventions to enhance the function of the living drug you have injected. 
So uh, that too is, a, is an emerging field of uh, study. So we engineer cells, but we engineer or manipulate cells to do what? You want the cells to improve uh, their persistence, their function. And I think Alberto gave a very good uh, uh, introduction and, and showed data about the importance of this. Um, you can try to improve their uh, uh, trafficking. As you know, some tumors, for example, are extremely refractory to T cell infiltration. Um, improve or, or completely change T cell specificity. We see that with uh, TCR transgenics or, or CAR T cell, or even give new functions. You know, some, some, some cells have been engineered to secrete enzymes to remodel the extracellular matrix, for instance, that uh, is only indirectly linked to immunology. So I mostly worked on uh, these uh, uh, two aspects here, um, uh, circled in, in, in red, and I will uh, show you recent stories that were um, published about uh, some, um, some findings uh, we have made in, uh, in the area. So um, T-cell dysfunction, I will not uh, uh, describe that too much because Luis uh, um, Alberto did a very uh, good job. He said that he would not discuss about senescence and that's excellent because that is what I'm going to talk about. So um, we did an experiment um, several years ago where uh, we repeatedly stimulated ex vivo T cells with NTCD3, CD28. And what you can see here, if you can see my, my, my little mouse here, is that after weekly stimulations, you get another nice increase and then the cells will crash. Humans are not mice, so they're not identical. So some people, cells were crashing late, other were crashing earlier. But the truth here is that if you look at one stimulation, when the cells are extremely well at day seven, they have not expanded much, but they are in full proliferation. What you see is that they are mostly TCM, central memory. And Alberto told you that this is a, this is a good thing because um, these cells are endowed with a uh, a capacity to self-renew um, and uh, to persist long-term. And if you repeat the stimulations, you'll see a gradual increase towards uh, effector memory or uh, effector uh, cells, which are, no, no, which are not long-lived, especially for effectors, and have lost their uh, capacity to, um, to uh, differentiate or mostly self-renew. Um, this was accompanied by the expression of the um, immune checkpoint PD-1 and also other immune checkpoints such as uh, TIM-3 or um, 2B4. And you can see that the um, cytokine secretion of, this, of these cells that were crashing at the very end uh, was also very much uh, decreased. So repeated stimulations lead to um, dysfunction. That's not a big surprise. Uh, everybody knew that. But we compared the transcriptome of cells at day zero, day, se day seven, and one, uh, and, and at the time they, they crashed. And what was very, very clear from the transcriptome was that there was a, 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 a salient uh, uh, in your face um, senescent signature. That was very, very obvious. Everything seemed to be centered around P16, which is a very well-known um, modulator of, of T cell senescence. This was accompanied, uh, obviously, with decreased proliferation, increased evidence of DNA damage with gamma H2AX, and in PD1 expressing cells only, the expression of uh, beta galactosidase, which is a marker of senescence. Importantly, the telomeres, the telomere length did not change. So um, this required a bit of, um, of, of searching, but there, there is a phase of senescence before you reach um, telomere erosion, where you see DNA damage, you see an arrest in proliferation, and the literature had suggested to us that this state could be uh, reversible. So this is what we tried to do. We um, repeatedly stimulated T cells in vitro as we did before, but we transduced very early on a CAR T cell into uh, the cells. And after several rounds of stimulation, we switched the stimulation mode 
to stimulate through the car um, using uh, KMS-11 that expressed uh, the antigen BCMA um, that was targeted by, uh, by the car. And what we saw was that P16 uh, inhibition at um, or knockdown uh, with shRNA at day uh, between day 14 and 21 change um, in, well reinstated pr um, uh, proliferation in some cells decreased uh, galactosidase uh, beta galactosidase expression and um, uh, restored cytokine secretion in uh, some of the CAR T cells. So um, directly interfering with senescence mechanisms was able to, um, to partly revert uh, the, um, the, the, the dysfunctional features we had, um, we had uh, observed. So um, this is uh, one way uh, we have, uh, and others have also studied other um, pathways around senescence. And uh, there uh, are probably other avenues to manipulate um, T cell senescence that uh, do not involve necessarily the knockdown of a crucial uh, modulator such as P60. So this is to be, uh, to be uh, continued. Importantly, our data set has, uh, have given us, has given us um, candidate pathways and genes for probably the next decade to study. Uh, and um, that will be uh, very, uh, very important because um, as, as uh, you can see uh, by looking at Alberto's work and, and our work, uh, there are several candidate pathways and it's very hard to define at this point or to guess which of the interventions will uh, be most uh, decisive to uh, increase um, the efficacy of T cells. So um, we have also um, uh, tried more classic, I would say, interventions to um, increase T cell manufacturing, and uh, this is a recent uh, study we, um, we 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 published where we were able to um, improve uh, antigen-specific T cell expansion in a clinical um, clinical compliant uh, system by um, blocking during manufacturing. Um, the uh, PDL1, PD1 axis, and uh, TIM3. So, as you can see here, is when you stimulate um, rare antigen specific T cells in order to make a, a product, a therapy that would be uh, infusible, what you, you, need to, you need to repeatedly stimulate uh, T cells. So, you can see that from day 14 to day 28, there's a gradual decrease of, um, of, of, of T cells, of antigen specific T cells in proportion. However, you can see at the bottom there that the relatively, well, the relative fold increase or, or the cell growth of the entire culture does not stop. What it means is that to reach clinical level in terms of cell dose, you need to push the culture to a point where you gradually lose the antigen specific T cells that you want. So we wanted to find a way to um, uh, prevent this to, uh, to happen. So we looked at immune checkpoint expression. The, the antigen we were targeting was from a um, viral protein and it was on uh, CD8 T cells. And what was very obvious was that from the very beginning of the culture, um, PD-1 and TIM-3 were uh, uh, expressed at high frequency, and as the culture progressed, there was co-expression, which is um, known to be a sign of uh, dysfunction. So we introduced uh, blocking antibodies to the culture, and we realized, and that's the top line here, that the, um, when you block the PD-L1, PD-1 axis, um, or TIM3, you achieve nothing. In fact, the, the T cell yield is, is lower than when you don't use anything. So, however, on the contrary, when you use the two together, you get marked uh, uh, expansion, both at day 14 and, and 21. So um, this to us was uh, a fairly revealing, especially um, with what we saw after, that's the lower, the lower panels, where um, we, see, we saw that this intervention did not change the differentiation status or the, um, the, the, the immune uh, checkpoint uh, expression. So we were, from this, 
uh, anticipating uh, more cells of equal quality based on our uh, intervention. So um, what we what we further further notice was that, and you can see that here, is that when you use single blockade, you actually have lower amounts of cells. This is because, um, and it's mostly true for TIM3, very early on in the T cell response, TIM3 gives a positive signal to the T cells and not a negative one. So we delayed TIM3 in uh, anti-TIM3 um, uh, treatment by a week and we further um, increased our uh, T cell T cell yield. So the the double blockade and and delayed double blockade and where we when we uh, push uh, TIM3 by a week was able to generate highly functional um, T cells on the basis of cytokine release and cytotoxicity that I am not uh, showing. Um, with a co-expression of, uh, of cytokines, which is a, a sign of uh, fitness. So we wanted to look into this a bit deeper and we sorted the antigen-specific T cells, which are uh, stainable with a um, MHC peptide uh, fluorescent multimer. And we send these cells um, for um, RNA sequencing. So in the control condition where there was no antibody, and in the block condition, when the, where the two antibodies were um, were uh, were used, so really we we were we were expecting uh, uh, real big differences because uh, the ex the expansion was was so huge, the difference was so important, and um, the phenotypes, um, it, well, the function the functionality was also uh, a bit different. So we wanted to know whether there was chronotype or repertoire abundance difference between the two conditions and what were the transcriptional signatures uh, associated with a good expansion versus a lousy expansion. And what was very striking was that after all this treatment, three weeks in culture, the most important feature to determine what was, what was the transcriptome was actually the donor. So we used three donors and irrespective of conditions, cells from the same donor tended to cluster together. So really three islands, three uh, different uh, donors, and the different clusters that were identified were also uh, donor uh, restricted. When we looked at the different um, gene signature, uh, you can see there on the, on the right, um, we saw that it was going all over the place. There was no consistent signature across the three donors. And that to us was um, a, bit, um, a bit surprising. We would have expected, for example, relative to control, that all double, double blocked uh, uh, cells would have uh, better uh, T cell proliferation, for instance, uh, a gene expression, um, and less terminal differentiation. But we didn't see any of that. Um, the clonal distribution was um, was not, and that's the left panel, was not uh, terribly different between the two um, the two conditions. Slight differences. Uh, each color is a different clone. Um, the following three weeks in culture, the repertoire of the antigen specific cell is is markedly oligoclonal. Um, but again, there were there were a few differences, but uh, they were not necessarily going the same direction. Oops, I'm, I'm sorry. So you can see here that in donor two, the double blocked uh, condition uh, appears to be more restricted in clonotype number, while uh, it's the opposite for donor three, where we had two dominant uh, clonotypes rather than a single one. So we said, aha, perhaps that we didn't see differences in the overall T cell composition, but if we look at transcriptome clone by clone, can we figure out something? And um, we had, we were lucky enough, although it was partly expected, to find clonotypes that were shared by different donors. Clonotype one, for instance, and clonotype three here, that were that were shared. And you can see here T cell terminal differentiation. If you compare the double blockade condition to the control, for one donor, the signature was less here, and for the other, it was more. So it was going in the opposite direction for, um, for the same clone. 
Interestingly, and I'm not showing this data, but when you add terminal differentiation here in, um, in, uh, in donor two, well, um, the clonotype uh, was less abundant at day 21 than at day 28. So perhaps the differentiation uh, somehow uh, was related to a decreased frequency as the, uh, of this clonotype in, in that culture. So um, there are probably uh, very subtle uh, factors in clonotype uh, dynamics following um, a double uh, uh, blockade but no consistent wall-to-wall, -wall, uh, easily, uh, easily uh, uh, discernible uh, difference uh, across, uh, well, that would be consistent across donors. So um, no clear answer, but a lot of fun uh, analyzing single cell data. So immune checkpoint blockade during T-cell expansion improves CD8 antigen-specific T-cell yield without accelerating T-cell differentiation or exhaustion. There are no consistent effects on clonal composition or function. And um, in fact, what I'm not showing you is that um, this is very specific to this type of culture. If you do a checkpoint blockade on car cultures, we didn't, well, we didn't see anything. And uh, when you apply it to other forms of virus specific T cell culture, you don't see it either. It's really when you take a very rare set of clones and you expand them uh, through a long-term culture of 21 to 28 days. So I'm going to finish the, um, the, uh, the talk by uh, talking about our translational uh, adventures. And again, some good, some bad, and some ugly, uh, for, for sure. So um, the first bad uh, is that a clinical translation is a lot of unglorious work where um, you refine your process, you write very long procedures. Um, so uh, if an image is worth a thousand words, um, this is uh, what we were faced with when we translated our virus specific T cells from the research lab to the GMP production. Um, so uh, Julie Oriot there, who's, um, who's holding the, um, the, <laughs> the two sets of papers, um, was in fact in charge of, of both uh, of setting up the thing in my lab and at the CETC. So she, she probably wrote all these pages. So um, kudos to, um, to Julie. So um, our first target was uh, virus specific uh, uh, complications after, after bone marrow transplant, um, which is my, my clinical interest as, as, Terry, as Terry said. So a lot of viruses can affect the immunosuppressed patient. And we wanted to focus on EBV for, for two reasons. Um, it is not only um, a, a virus that can cause lymphoma in transplant patients, it is also a virus that can cause cancer in normal people as well. So um, we wanted to uh, have a, uh, or develop a, a pro or implement a protocol to treat um, EBV or prevent EBV related lymphomas. So um, most of adults, a great majority of, of adults are, are EBV seropositive, meaning that they have a T cell repertoire um, with what well, that is uh, memory um, for uh, this virus. Oh, it's, a, it's a virus that lives into us for the, our entire lives. And um, there is always an army of T cell ready to um, fight off uh, reactivations, except when the, uh, you're immunosuppressed in the context of, of, of transplantation or, or otherwise. So um, here we did not use a single peptide to stimulate uh, EBV, um, EBV reactive cells. We used uh, synthetic peptides that cover uh, the entire length of antigenic proteins. So that means that we don't have to worry about HLA restriction. The coverage is so huge that there, is, there are very good chances that everyone can, uh, can react to, to, these, uh, to these peptides. So, we cultured them in two weeks in a short and small bioreactor that we call a JREX, um, which uh, has a semi permeable membrane for gas exchange at the bottom and a very uh, uh, tall column of uh, media for, for nutrients. 
So, so that really speeds up uh, the um, the expansion. Uh, we we borrowed this um, from the Baylor College of Medicine. In fact, we we got very very good help from from Anne Lean there when we uh, set that up and uh, Catherine uh, Bollard. Um, and uh, we did uh, also uh, publish our um, preclinical work when we were uh, setting that up in uh, 2015. So uh, these uh, pathogen-specific uh, T-cell lines um, are generated from uh, 15 million PBMCs. So that's two tubes of blood, okay? That's not a lot. And you can uh, manufacture several doses out of a single expansion. Someone like me, who's um, uh, 5'11", uh, okay, perhaps I should not tell you my weight, but uh, I, I'm, a, I'm around two, two meters square in body surface area. So you need um, 40 million cells to treat someone like me. Uh, so from a single expansion, you can prepare uh, several, several doses. And the specificity of the T cell line you generate is extremely um, uh, good. So EBNA1 and LMP2 are the two uh, proteins we used for uh, educating the cells uh, ex vivo. And you see the LE spot reactivity. So one spot is one cell secreting interferon gamma when um, uh, in contact with the peptides. So you see that if you use an irrelevant peptide or cells only, there's nothing. Uh, the positive control is an anti-CD3 uh, antibody. So EBNA1 and LMP2 uh, are the only places or the only conditions where you see a secretion. The cytotoxicity assay on the right bottom shows that um, the uh, allogenic targets are not are not killed by these cells, which is very important because we want to use these cells in transplantation. And we obviously don't want to cause um, Grad versus host disease or rejection episodes. Um, and you see that there is a, um, a very sharp uh, cytotoxicity to autologous um, targets pulse with the, the relevant peptides. So um, the first patient uh, we treated um, uh, now almost five years ago um, had refractory PTLD after a um, uh, aplo, aplo identical stem cell transplant um, was not responding to um, to rituximab, which is a standard treatment, could not tolerate chemotherapy very well, and um, we manufactured the, the, the T cells from um, uh, his donor. And um, gradually the uh, lymphoma regressed. Um, and uh, what was cool to see is that at, at week zero, there was um, absolutely no EBV or, or uh, reactivity or very, very little. And um, after the cells, we saw EBV reactivity climb up in the blood and, um, and, and stay there for, for, several, for several months. He reactivated his EBV after the study was, was over, uh, and uh, that did not turn into important complications. There was spontaneous uh, resolution of the viremia, implying that um, he had reconstituted uh, some of his anti-EBV uh, uh, immunity, enough to protect him. Second patient was a liver transplant. Uh, it was not the second patient. We had, the, I'm showing you the spectacular images. Sometimes we, we use these cells only to treat um, refractory EBV reactivation without lymphoma. But um, we, we treated three active lymphoma, uh, all of them uh, cured with, uh, with the cells. So 63 year old female liver, liver transplant, patient had no immunity against EBV and received a liver that was full of EBV. So um, that's usually is recipe for, for disaster or complications because you don't have any immunity to fight the virus you receive through the transplant. So um, ER lymphoma was refractory to chemotherapy. Uh, so we used a, a cell line from a brother that was part, partly matched to ER and partly matched to the liver. Uh, and uh, we gave two infusion two months apart. And uh, you can see here um, active lymphoma. Uh, so follow my, my little arrow here. So that's the heart. So it's metabolically active. That's a good sign. Um, there is accumulation of the tracer in the bladder and in the renal pelvises. But aside there from these, from these places, there are lymphoma implants. 
uh, a bit everywhere in the abdomen that vanished uh, after after treatment. So rapidly generated T cell lines are highly effective to treat or prevent viral reactivations post transplantation. There are clinical trial on, uh, trials ongoing. The, the group at Baylor who helped us set up created a company called Alovir, where they use allogenic um, uh, T cells uh, to prevent um, viral reactivation post transplant. Um, Atara licensed the uh, technology from uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering to do the same thing for EBV. And we are eyeing possible commercializations, uh, commercialization in the, in the future. Um, clinical grade manufacturing is very expensive, difficult to support for academic institution. That's part of the bad and ugly. Uh, and importance of process development for pre to post infusion is uh, extremely um, important. So um, just to finish on this, I can tell you that uh, the EBV trial that we set up in 2017, that was only seven years, uh, five years ago, would probably not be doable today because the landscape have, has evolved so much, the prices have gone up, um, it's very hard to get institutional support and there are commercial products uh, coming. So um, it is in that context e extremely hard. Um, from the moment that cell therapies have been perceived as drug by the regulatory agencies, um, it's very, very uh, difficult um, to, to, to craft them um, uh, in academic institution and administer them to, to treat patients. So um, this is um, uh, uh, something I, I needed to say. This is a big part of the ugly uh, that uh, is afflicting uh, cell therapy now. And um, we, we definitely collectively as academicians, we, we definitely need to uh, identify the, the niches where um, the, uh, well, where, where academic manufacturing is, uh, is, is possible um, and uh, get, get obviously funds to, to run all this. So uh, these are conversations I frequently have with people at the MRM and others, and uh, I will I will conclude uh, on that. Thank you very much.